Just a quick little message before we begin. This channel has prided itself on not having been sponsored ever for money, and that is a result of your support, be it by watching the videos or because of the merch you've purchased on Yongya.com, be it Yongya themed shirts, the loot box shaped stress box, the hat back there, cups, you name it. And also on Patreon, I really appreciate the support. And in return, I give my time, be it audio, video, clip requests to full-on video chats. If you're interested in checking those out to support the channel, feel free to do so. But if not, just happy to have you here watching this video and watching all the other stuff and the active interaction that I've seen. Really appreciate it. But without further ado, here's what I thought about Elden Ring. Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Been playing the closed network test on PlayStation 5 for a few days now. Played about 10 hours of it. This is the same build people who signed up will get to play between November 12th and 14th. And this build featured a small portion of the full open world map with boundaries to section off where you're not meant to go. And there comes a point where your progression is halted completely. But there was still a decent amount of stuff to do in what little portion of the game was accessible. Now the first thing to get out of the way is that this is mechanically at its core, a quintessential from soft Soulsborne game, closest to Dark Souls 3, I'd say, though it combines elements of all Soulsborns, essentially. As far as similarities go, I mean the controller layout, the feel of movement and combat, animations, the progression and leveling system, collecting souls equivalents called runes, and finding safe haven in bonfire equivalents called sites of grace to spend those souls and renew your healing flasks, the punishing level design, the brutally merciless and awe-inspiringly designed boss battles, the mostly helpful and at times deceitful messaging multiplayer feature, the ability to play co-op or PvP via an invasion equivalent system, it's all there and mostly going to feel very familiar. If you are hoping for the core mechanics to feel radically different from all other From Software games, you're not going to get that here. Not to say that there isn't anything new. The jump button from Sekiro makes its way into the more Dark Souls-like Elden Ring sons, the ability to hang from ledges. There is horseback riding and combat. The riding was easy to become acclimated to. The horseback combat took a bit getting used to, but was rewarding to learn. There are these things called Ashes of War, which are essentially swappable combat arts and skills that can be applied to weapons and gear, activated with the left trigger button. Your healing flask can regenerate upon defeating groups of enemies out in the open world, and more. Deaths are also made a bit more forgiving out in the open world at least, thanks to the introduction of the sporadically spread out Marika statues, which are non-bonfire checkpoints that upon death will allow you to be taken back there instead of a more distant bonfire. It just saves players from having to undergo the tedium of having to retraverse large portions of the open world to retry an encounter, which for my part felt very welcome. But these are tweaks and enhancements to familiar core mechanics rather than a full evolution of it. What really does mix the formula up is that this is a Soulsborne game whose structure is influenced by the expansive open world, which is something of a first for the series. Whereas past Soulsborne games worlds featured a series of levels intricately connected by passages, hallways, and shortcuts, seamlessly traversable akin to an open world game but not quite fully open world, Elden Ring's world is closer to what you'd find in games like Skyrim and Breath of the Wild. So what you get here that you didn't get in past Soulsborne games is that sense of, ooh, what's that in the distance? I want to go check that out and see what I find. And usually if there is something interesting looking in the distance, you can go to it. Whereas past Soulsborne games sense of discovery was more akin to, wait a minute, what's that thing in the corner there? And there's plenty of that in Elden Ring as well once you delve into those individual dungeons and levels. But now layered on top of that is this macro level sense of discovery. Discoveries you make in the open world can be anything from boss battles roaming the open world itself, which are really cool, enemy encampments housing lootable chests and valuable treasures, groups of enemies transporting precious cargo, platforming challenges that lead to hidden rewards, shopkeepers and crafting stations to upgrade gear, 
crafting materials littered all throughout which can be used to craft consumables on the spot, strange NPCs with ominous things to say or strange stories to share, many dungeons housing various challenges and rewards, and the larger, more epic, grand scale levels that are more akin to what Soulsborne fans might be familiar with, which are part of the main story and the main questline. So Elden Ring is a Soulsborne whose levels are connected by traversable open world sandbox space filled with things to fight, discover, and interact with in between those key levels. Enough open space that it can accommodate horse riding gameplay. A convenient and flexible fast travel system. A compass that not only offers cardinal directions, but also points you to important things like retrievable souls, and even an open world map. Stealth also becomes a stronger option in the open world with encampments being able to be sneakily and strategically tackled, to the point where at times it could feel MGS5-esque, with guards being able to alert nearby enemies and everything, albeit with far more rudimentary stealth mechanics and definitely dumber AI. There is even a telescope feature that allows you to survey your surroundings to plan out your routes and whatnot. The map itself you'll assemble by collecting map fragments, though in my time with this build, I actually couldn't find it, hence why the map lacks detail in this footage. I later learned where to actually find it and I just happened to miss it, but even in its incomplete state, the map showed me icons of discovered locations and bonfires, or sites of grace as they're known in this game, and I still found uses for things like placing markers on the map that show up as beacons in the open world to guide you through your navigation. There's an expanded sense of freedom here that you never got in past Soulsborne entries, at least not to this scale. Things just feel a lot more non-linear, there's more room to walk off the beaten path and let your curiosity navigate you and create your own adventure. And that's enough of a differentiator for Elden Ring to not make this feel like just an over-familiar experience. Curiosity in this game is rewarded in both little ways like the talking bipedal pot that you can encounter as shown in the Elden Ring gameplay overview, or in big ways like this giant dragon that swoops in if you approach this specific section of the open world map, which you can decide to tackle as soon as you encounter it, or you can come back at any time at your leisure when you feel prepared. These open world bosses in particular allow you to take advantage of horseback combat as well, which adds an extra dimension. The game also does a really good job of nudging you just enough without holding your hand. Certain bonfires or sites of grace will emanate a streak of light pointing in a cardinal direction, and you can see where that streak points in the map as well. So you're getting this small tip on the general direction of the next objective or location, but that's it. The rest is up to you. The open world is also not tedious to navigate, with the horse acting as an expedient form and mode of transportation, with its speed and double jump capabilities, and with bonfires you can fast travel between being distributed fairly evenly throughout the world. You can essentially at any point bring up the map and fast travel to any bonfire, as long as you're not engaged with enemies or in any sort of immediate danger, which makes this the most forgiving fast travel system yet in a From Software game, and one that I personally feel is welcome in this open world structure. Structure, as I don't consider navigational tedium to be a fun challenge, it's just tedium. Now once you delve into dungeons and key levels, that's where things become more traditional Soulsborne. There are no maps serving as blueprints to map out the layout of levels and dungeons or anything like that. These levels consist of interconnected corridors, hallways, passages, and shortcuts that house sneakily placed enemies and traps that you'll have to familiarize yourself with as you keep trekking further and dying and reviving in a bonfire and trying to overcome the challenges ahead. So the map is mainly there to help you navigate the open world and get you from location to location, but the locations themselves won't offer that kind of navigational guidance. You'll find areas and dungeons of varying sizes, some large and important, others small and optional, and there's definitely something really cool about having these mini dungeons and levels that you can optionally stumble upon and discover alongside the main quest stuff. It's a similar feeling to the joy of 
discovering those smaller mini-dungeon shrines in Breath of the Wild along the journey of tackling the main dungeons, or stumbling upon smaller dungeons in Skyrim off the beaten path. Except the dungeons here are, well of course, more Soulsborne-esque. There's usually some kind of boss or mini-boss or unique enemy types in these dungeons and rewards that you can earn. And having a bunch of these spread throughout the open world on top of the big key locales has made for a fun and tense sense of exploration. Exploration is made all the more compelling by the visual splendor of this game, which is far from the most graphically and technically advanced, but more than makes up for it with its art direction, style, and design. There is also a decent amount of wildlife you can find out and about, and beyond breathing life into the world, offer crafting materials and lootable items when hunted. There is also a full day and night cycle and weather system for further visual variety, though how much this stuff affects activity within the open world, apart from changes in level of visibility, remains to be seen in the final game. It's something that I didn't get to really pay too much attention to. Enemy designs are also compelling and show the same amount of care and creativity as past Soulsborne titles. Boss battles in particular tend to be my favorite part of these kinds of games. That's what I mainly play these to look forward to the next boss battle challenge. And so far, Elden Ring is not disappointing on that front. I was surprised by the number of bosses you could find in this small piece of the open world, which leaves me optimistic for the amount of content there will be in the final game, and how much there will be to explore and find and discover, and just how rewarding exploration will be. There is one major story boss that this network test allows you to tackle in particular, who really kicked my ass for a bit with intricate attack patterns and conditions for follow-up attacks that made it challenging to become acclimated to his offensive maneuvers. But as with other Soulsborne titles, there was that initial sense of frustration and credulity and frickin' self-loathing that preceded the sense of inching closer and closer to victory. And once I achieved it, the catharsis and release made me go full Michael Jordan in my celebration. Michael at the foul line, a shot on Eagle! That taste of sweet and hard-earned victory, following seemingly insurmountable struggle and odds, and how much more skilled of a player I came away for it, that Soulsborne essence is very much present in Elden Ring. Soulsborne titles are the definition of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and From Software has continued to master this formula, and that's very much preserved in Elden Ring as well. And while this game does not have an easy mode per se, it does offer multiplayer options that can help ease the load with co-op features that work similarly to past games. You use an item to signal you want to engage in co-op gameplay and you'll eventually be paired up with someone. Or you can lay down a signal that says, I want to do PvP, and if you're into that, you can do that too. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play multiplayer too much because there were so few people playing during the media only network test period so it's just hard to match make with other players but I imagine this won't be a problem in the final game once you know thousands hundreds of thousands millions are playing it what little I did test of it however worked pretty well and multiplayer should prove to be really interesting in the far more expansive open world environment and structure Another optional way to ease the load for players is the ability to summon spirits. There's only so much they can do with certain boss battles, but they can dish out some additional damage alongside yourself, though no doubt many purists will choose to maybe not use these and tackle bosses one-on-one, -on -one, but the option's there, which is nice. I never felt like these will ever carry a battle. It's up to you ultimately to defeat the boss through skill and learning patterns and timing and all that stuff. Replayability is also preserved in the form of character builds that match a wide variety of playstyles. The network test had a handful of preset classes with different stats wielding a variety of different armor types, gear, and weapons, and as you'd expect, each weapon has its own moveset you can master and favor, though of course in the final game you can expect even more options alongside the ability to play a deprived equivalent class for those who like to start with a blank slate. I tried a couple of these and like before, dex builds aim for lighter but faster attacks, Strength builds aim for slower but chonkier attacks. Magic focus builds lean on spells quite a bit, so on and so forth. The spells in particular got something of a facelift with cooler, more impactful, and more creative effects and animations. To the point where it actually makes me want to try out a mage build, which was never the most appealing type of build in other Soulsborne games for me. So yeah, there's honestly very little that I disliked about my time with Elden Ring so far. It's more of what fans like about From Software games, but expanded in its structure and features. Now, if you're someone who has tried Soulsborne games and didn't like them, I don't think Elden Ring is going to be the one that's going to change your mind about the genre, but veterans no doubt will find a lot that's welcome here, and newcomers who have been curious about these types of games, 
I think they'll find this worth trying out and worth exploring and worth going through the struggle. Once you get through that initial phase of struggle and the game finally clicks for you, it's some of the most rewarding stuff you can experience in gaming. Now, I do hope that they iron out certain kinks like the game's performance before the final game comes out. I did experience frequent frame rate drops and stutters. Nothing super disruptive, but definitely noticeable and distracting at times. This primarily happens when the game is loading in assets as you approach large open spaces or just on random occasions here and there. I also did experience one or two instances where inputs were dropped completely or significantly delayed, and I'm well aware of Soulsborne's queuing system for button inputs, and it works 99% of the time, but there were times when the dodge button, for example, didn't register my input even when my character wasn't in the middle of doing an action that would have prevented the dodging from occurring, and there was another instance where the input registered severe late. Only happened like three times, but in a game like Elden Ring, something like this happening once can get you killed in a really good run or at least woefully punished. Fortunately, there are three months of development left before the game launches, so they do have a good amount of time to polish things up. So we'll see what happens, and it's not as if this game feels unpolished at this stage, but it could iron out a few things here and there. It's also worth noting that due to how mechanically similar this game is to past Soulsborne games, it does mean that some long-running flaws do carry over, like the game's lock-on system, which works mostly but can behave weirdly here and there, how the camera tracks locked on targets, and then at times troublesome camera in general did screw me over a few occasions here and there. The camera does show a noticeable improvement with how it doesn't get stuck on objects as much anymore, but walls or strange lock-on behavior can still screw the camera up a decent amount, disruptively enough. There were also a few instances where some of the hitboxes felt like they made no sense, but <laughs> Soulsborne veterans will know that the occasional frustrating bullshit hitbox that doesn't seem to fully coincide with animations is kind of par for the course, for better or for worse. But in the grand scheme of things, honestly, these all feel like nitpicks. Elden Ring is a Soulsborne whose structural differences and its emphasis on macro-level exploration and discovery makes the formula feel pretty fresh, at least so far. Obviously, the final verdict will come when I get my hands on the final game and play it all the way through, experience the breadth of content it has to offer. I can't wait to see all of the boss fights and how cool they are. They're looking super dope so far. But if this is a sampler of things to come, hell. We may very well be in store for an epic meal. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my impressions of the 10 hours that I spent with Elden Ring through its network test, and many of you will be getting your hands with it as well. So if you've been able to get in, let me know in the comments below what your thoughts and opinions are on this game, and let me know based on these impressions for those who maybe aren't able to check the game out. If you're looking forward to it, if you're still on the fence, if it's not for you, let me know what you think about this game overall in the comments below, and to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.